Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 91 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris and this is Chris. Hello. This time we read The Little Stranger by Sarah Waters at the request of our patron Veronica. Veronica said that she expected this book to be, quote, Downton Abbey with ghosts, end quote, but was disappointed in how that concept was executed. Uh, if this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, some combination of those three, or based on a recommendation from a friend or patron, as we're doing today. Uh, So we do the opposite of what most people do when they are in a bookstore or if they're browsing online for an ebook. Usually, this experiment results in a disappointing and hilarious read, uh, but once in a while we do actually end up liking the book. Uh, For content warnings today, we have our usual barnyard language, plus we've got some classism, dog on child violence, uh, euthanasia, ghosts, mental illness, maybe a touch of some light British countryside racism, uh, fucking our, our good friend sexual assault that just can't fucking stay Uh, away. Yeah, there it is again. (laughs) God. Can't get away. Nope. We thought we were safe. We thought we were safe. It was like three. Oh, and, oh, sorry, sorry. One more. And, and this is actually important. The final content warning for today is suicide. So Mm -hmm. there's, yeah, it's a lot of dark themes today. I will say at least the assaulty bit isn't like. Yeah, it's not the worst. All the, I'm not going to even finish that sentence, but. (laughs) Well, it's, it's, I just want to put it out there just in case, but it's, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, people having a misunderstanding, uh, not great, but anyway, um, (laughs) moving on. So the summary of The Little Stranger is thus. One post-war summer in his home of rural Warwickshire, Dr. Faraday, the son of a maid who has built a life of quiet respectability as a country physician, is called to a patient at Lonely Hundreds Hall. Home to the Ayers family for over two centuries, the Georgian house, once impressive and handsome, is now in decline, its masonry crumbling, its gardens choked with weeds, the clock in its stable yard permanently fixed at twenty to nine. Its owners, mother, son, and daughter, are struggling to keep pace with the changing society, as well as with conflicts of their own. But are the heirs as haunted by something more sinister than a dying way of life? Little does Dr. Faraday know how closely and how terrifyingly their story is about to become intimately entwined with his. Um, not sure if I said Warwickshire right. Warwickshire. Warwickshire. I don't know. Just just skip all the... If you're not careful, the bobbies will come after you, Paris. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um... What's all this, then? You can't pronounce Warwickshire the proper way? Oh, wow. You can't do a British accent at all. No. <laughs> that's, that's astonishing. Well, I didn't try one last episode. I mean, I can't. Clearly, I <laughs> clearly I can't do them either, as last episode proved. Um, we might have our, to do a little bit of that, considering most of this book is like, how dreadfuls and my uh, goodness. And I know, I know. All, all that kind of thing. So if you really dig... Like, you know, upper class Brits in a post-war period clutching their pearls a lot, yeah. then maybe this is for you? Yeah, with some light ghostiness. Um, yeah, so our our characters and our setting, we've talked about the setting. It's pretty much everything happens at Hundreds Hall, which is a, a fictional estate in Warwickshire, England. Um, and the only other real setting, there's like a party one time. Uh, there's a couple scenes in a, in the doctor's car, and then at the doctor's um, kind of like practice and his house. He but keeps it's... saying dispensary, so in my head I was like, oh, he's selling weed. Well, it's I his... know is not the case, but no, but it's like you know, it's like his farm, the pharmacy part of the 
of the practice. But um, yes, but most 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 of the shit happens in Hundreds Hall. Um, our characters are Doctor Faraday. Uh, he is our narrator, uh, and also the main character. We have uh, oh Colonel Ayers. He fucking he's like dead already at the start of the story. So fuck him. Uh, Mrs. Ayers. I forget her first name. I'll call her Mrs. Ayers. Uh, Roderick, um, Carolyn, Susan, who is dead by the time the story begins, and then Jip the dog, and Mrs. Fuck, is it Bately? <laughs> Mrs. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mrs. F. Dash. Yeah. Uh, which <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll talk we'll get, about. We'll cover yeah. that in a moment. Um, is it Mrs. Mrs. Bately or Beasley? God, why can't Beasley? Can I, I just finished this last night. It's um, Mrs. Beasley. Mrs. Beasley and the other servant girl. Betty. Betty, thank you. Bees. Bees, the bees. The bees. Um, is that right? Not the bees. Is it Beasley? No, it's not Beasley. You're wrong. It's Beasley. No, you're wrong. <laughs> what, it's, what is it? I think it's, I don't know. I uh, read it as Beasley all the time, so to me, that's my headcanon better. It's Baisley. <laughs> okay, well, it's Beasley to me, so. Baisley. Oh. You're going to hear me say Beasley this whole podcast. Chris, so do, you know what, do you know what sound an A makes? It's Baisley. I, I don't, you know what? I'm rewriting reality to fit my perspective <laughs> because that's what we can do. That's what we do in America. It's yeah. fine. Um, all right. So, and then there's maybe a ghost or something. I don't know. We'll We'll talk about it. It could be, yeah. Uh, so it's it's Haunted House Trouble Family, Paris. Hey, you yeah, remember Crimson ha- Peak? Haunted House Trouble Family. Yeah, you remember Crimson Peak? You remember We're the haunting re- of remember the haunting of Hill House? You remember uh, I don't know the the fall of the House of Usher? Uh, there's just so many of these Trouble Family Haunted House books. Um, yeah, it's it's I that. I want there to be a troubled house and a haunted family. <laughs> Well, this house is also troubled because it's fucking falling apart at the seams. Um, and that's like the major issue in the book for the most part is, oh, no, we're going to lose the estate. We only have two servants. The indignity. Yeah. So it's the 1940s. It's after, you know, after war. And um, yeah, it's just this the family who's the main focus of this, the heirs. They're, yeah, they're just, they're upper class British, like white British family that is just wholly concerned with their appearance and how their mansion is falling into disrepair. Um, And yeah, it's, it's, uh, they're just not characters that I found, I couldn't like them. And that was kind of a big problem with me for the book. Like just my personal issue. Um, I just couldn't like them. But uh, anyhow, we should probably just go they through try it. to be a little bit sympathetic with it. I mean, Roderick suffered what the book keeps describing as a smash during yes. the war. So yeah, he had he was a, a pilot and or he was an airman of some kind, and um, his plane went down the war, and his um, his like uh, companion or whatever died while he lived, even though he had some pretty bad burns and. Uh, severe injury to his leg that leaves him limping. Um, that's Roderick. Caroline is his sister who had to come back to the hall to take care of him when he returned. And then their mother, Mrs. Ayers, is just, I don't know, just kind of there. Not really sure. Um, not sure why she couldn't take care of Roderick, but she's not that old. She's like, what, in her 50s, maybe? 60s, I think. Oh, still not Age doesn't not really old. Get brought up yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not old and like not so old that she wouldn't be able to take care of someone. So I don't know. Um, at the start of the book, we have Faraday being called to the house because Betty, their newest and youngest servant, I think she's like fourteen or something or fifteen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she's taken ill. Faraday gets there, calls her out on her bullshit, and is like, "Yo, what's the problem? You're not actually sick." And she's like. I'm sorry, son. You know, whatever they have, they have a, a thing. Uh, he ends up kind of taking over as their doctor, even though he's not normally. He only got called there because their normal physician was busy, and he, you know, he takes a liking to the family. And for the first hundred and twenty pages, all he does is go there and like hang out with them, and like that. He doesn't. <laughs> I mean, yes, but like he doesn't. It actually says that he has a, a dislike of them. 
a couple of times when he's hanging out over there. Right, which, right at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, leads me to the question of, like, why, why are you coming back here all the time? And that's, like, I suppose is sort of the whole crux of his character, right? Is even he's asking himself, why do I keep coming back here with these people? I am from a lower class upbringing. I shouldn't be mixing with these people as much as I am. In fact, he has an old memory of when he was a child, when he was there because his mom was a maid there, that he stole a piece of, like, plastic molding that was shaped uh, was, like a strawberry. It, it was a plaster, plaster, not plastic, and it was an acorn, not a strawberry. Okay, uh, well. But, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so he has mem- fond memories of this grand house from when he was a child, and you know, he goes back there and is like, oh, I have these good memories, but at first he doesn't really like them, and he doesn't, he's like, yeah, I know, I'm too poor to really be hanging out here, so. It's just one memory of him, like, going yeah. there for a, a party or something. Yeah, for a, for a party that they had, and his mom brought him, but, um, yeah, and it, the first, yeah, the first hundred and, I want to say it was, what, 120 pages or 110 or something, it's like nothing really happens. Uh, that's kind of it. I does he even start with he starts treating Roderick's leg for free so he could write a paper on this new um like electrical treatment for damaged muscles basically uh but i think that's the only thing that really happens yeah he just keeps showing up and being like yeah i'm here i'm, I'm here we're gonna again have, we're going to have just, some tea what, um, what are you guys doing uh, you all doing fine up here up in hundreds hall with your big empty rooms and your two servants yeah. yeah, okay. I guess I'll come back tomorrow and bug you guys again. This is really just a way to sort of get more background info on the family. You learn a little bit more about Roderick's injuries. You get a little bit more insight into Carolyn's personality as someone who's a little bit no-nonsense. Got a decent head on her shoulders, it seems, for the most part. Even though in, fa- I think even here, you can tell that Faraday is kind of hanging around for her a little bit, even though he's telling himself that he isn't and that yeah, he and isn't I think, attracted to her. Yeah, and here's here's the thing about Faraday. You kind of learn that he might be a slightly unreliable narrator. Um, just because, yeah, he's always telling us in, on the pages, like, oh, she's such a plain, big-boned, horse-faced woman or whatever he, he says. He doesn't say yeah. horse face. He says some things about her not being attractive uh, many times. And then... As the book goes on, you know, that changes. Although, I mean, this really just feels like we live in a small town and there's no one else to date. So I'm just going to cling to the first woman who talks to me. (laughs) I think there's ulterior motive here, which we might get into later. But for the most part, he, yeah, he spent like every time Carolyn shows up next to him, he's he's talking about her thickish legs and her flattish face. Yep. And how she's relatively plain, especially for such good stock that she comes from. <sighs> yeah. So he's it, 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 it's one of the you mentioned when we were first reading this book that you kind of liked how pretty much everyone isn't described as beautiful or attractive. The, the Faraday is always bringing up sort of the flaws or the things that you might not consider attractive or beautiful for both women and men on the, for the most part. Yeah. Cause he even says that he is not particularly good looking and describes. Yeah. So it was really refreshing, at least for us to read a book where nobody was so, like, nobody was some gorgeous person. It, well, even then he's still vain. And that would, that's yeah, the issue we had with people being, you know, the, the looks always being brought up in, in the writing in other books is it just seems so vain and it's it's the same thing but just from a the opposite end here right he's pretty much always talking about like oh well this is a little messed up the chin ain't great over here he's got burns on his face he's really just just like internally judging people all the time well i also think that as a doctor it's it's what he does he's supposed to look at people and assess their appearance for signs of malady i think he even mentions that at some point in the book and and i remember thinking like oh that does make some sense but yeah i mean he's still a kind of a jerk about it in his internal monologue um yeah anyway it's nice to read a book where no one's falling in love at first sight with some beautiful maiden or hot dude um it definitely <clears throat> this book definitely feels like british weather does you know it's uh it's dreary and gray it's probably raining or just rained, and nothing's super great. <laughs> I mean, that's 
Sarah Waters' strength here, right, is yeah, the tone is. setting yeah. and her ability to write in a way that for a little bit while I was reading the first part of this book, because I didn't check, like, the published data or anything, I was like, is this a recent book? Was this written yeah. back, like, in the post-war period? Most specifically because of the thing we brought up a, a couple of minutes ago, which I think it's a good time to bring up now, even though... Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it was written, it was published in 2009, so... Yeah, but so the thing that kind of made me have this thought was the fact that people will curse in this book. They'll say shit and damn... And hell, Nobody, and I don't. I don't know if they say shit. They definitely say that. There once is or twice. zero results for shit, Chris. Okay, I'm... well, I, I guess that might be off limits. But there's one word that's definitely off limits. Oh boy, and that's fuck. You can't say fuck in this book. Oh. I couldn't tell. Were the characters censoring their own selves, or was it Sarah Waters censoring the f word to make it seem as if this book was written? In the period she said it in, like they could, could, could you print fucking? You could print fucking books. I, dude, I, yeah, I don't think that this was a, this like is James definitely Joyce not, Ulysses had that a bunch. Yeah, right? yeah, like, this is this is definitely not a leftover thing from a past era of publishing. That is not the case. So this why, is just weird. Um, why yeah, did she censor the f word. I don't know. Like for example, it says, um, "Just give me back my f dash g cufflinks, will you?" Uh, don't get your hands off me. Don't you F slash G well tell me how to behave. And it was just so disrupting. Uh, it was. It so wasn't the characters going fug, right? Like no. <laughs> Who the F dash G hell are you anyway? Who the fug are you? I mean, it only happens four times, but it was so disruptive to the mood and and my experience of the story. I was like, what the fuck? Why would you censor this? So I don't know if I like accidentally bought a censored copy or something. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the, very the, odd. The Kindle for children. Versus, yeah. You I, got that one. Well, but like the only other curse word in it is damn, uh, which isn't even, I don't know that I'd even call that a curse so, word. Some people uh, might call hell. A oh yeah. Hell, too, yeah. If you're hell's, particularly sensitive. That's true. Hell's in there. Yeah. So, and I mean, and plus Ow, the, my the, freaking ears. Yeah. <laughs> my freaking ears. Um, <laughs> I mean, and the the story discusses some, you know, some difficult topics. So I, I don't understand what the the this point really is. This is a big mystery with the writing <laughs> style. Like everything else was perfectly serviceable, except this one little burr <laughs> amongst the rest of it that I just don't. Uh, why? Yeah, I. Does have... she have a personal thing against writing the f word, but still wants to use it? I uh, yeah, it's really no idea. I don't know. And also, if if they were if they were self censoring, if the characters themselves were saying like effing or something, wouldn't you write it e f f i n g or like f dash i n g? Like the f dash dash g is a strange <laughs> choice. I uh, I spent a solid two minutes just trying to decipher this one part of the book because it's really the just the most baffling part of. The- <laughs> yeah. Of the writing, well, yeah, it was it was very odd, and like I said, the the reason I think we're both hung up on it is because it's just so disruptive to yeah. this book that Sarah Waters has clearly put so much effort into, you know, into the the tone. On uh, yeah, so I don't know I if don't it was know. disruptive because it had me thinking that oh, was this book published at a time where they couldn't print the f word, which I know to not be true. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. So any, anyway, back to the story. So our main plot points, you know. Faraday gets called to the house because Betty's sick and their usual doctor can't make it. Um, he then, you know, he kind of doesn't like them, but he ends up going back there to, like, I think he runs into Carolyn and then they, you know, whatever. He keeps going back there because, I don't know, he's fucking bored. They live in a small-ass town. <laughs> whatever. Um, he starts helping Roderick with his leg because Roderick has, um... I, again, it, it's not really clear. You know, he he had... There was a plane crash. He had some burns on his face and um, his one of his legs was fucked up in some way we're not really sure what the exact injury was but any but it was some kind of um, muscular thing um so faraday starts doing this electrical treatment on him and writes a paper about it so he does it for free because he knows that even though they're you know they're from the upper class their wealth is waning uh pretty severely so they They can only afford two servants yeah i know so they develop so he kind of develops this um uneasy friendship with the family because he's going over there time and time again to work on, you know, Roderick's leg. 
Um, and, you know, finally, on page, I don't know, 110 or 120 or something, there's a party. They, they decide to throw a party, and we, we realize it's because Mrs. Ayers really wants Caroline to meet someone and get married because, you know, she's an old-ass spinster at 26. So... <laughs> Um, you know, I think the average age people get married was still, like, around 25 back then, so I don't really think that vibes... I mean, you know, still getting up there, probably, in terms of... Chris, I don't, class, but... I don't think that's true at all. I'm pretty sure the average age of marriage has consistently hovered around, like, 25 for women for quite a while. It's, it's one of those things that you wouldn't think so, but... For well, most... no, no, I think for men, you're right. But for women, they're always about five years older. I would say the average age of, like, women being married is probably 20. Anyway, whatever. Anyway, yeah. they, they kind of, she refers to herself as a spinster. And there is there is a light discussion of her, like, needing to be married or something. So, plus the family, you know, needs money. So, they have this party. They invite just a handful of their acquaintances from the town there and of course this guy that you know caroline's supposed to try to talk to um and faraday goes and i and there's this whole oh they invited faraday not as the doctor but as a guest oh the scandal the <laughs> scandal you know like that's like the big scandal you know like quarter of the way through the book you're like fuck me is something ever gonna happen in this book it's just whew. uh so finally the party's happening it's not great. Uh, it's just kind of happening. No one's having a super time. Some people are talking. They're in it's this old-ass saloon room that they yep. had just off to the side that was described as having, like, old yellow wallpaper and ugly furniture. Yeah. It, so it, it, even the setting isn't that great, and they've had to, like, dust everything off and try to make look, everything look nice, right. nicer than it is, really, to try to, I guess, hook this... He was part of a fan, like a more upper class or a family that's doing better. Yeah, than a family, the heirs. A fa- right? A family that has more money than they do. Yeah, it, it was a hyphenated last name that I for- forgot. The, now. the Parker Hides, um, Baker Hyde, I think. Baker Hides. Yeah, you're right. Um, I think, I think the guy was like a cousin to the Baker Hides or something like that. He was like the a- harpsichord dude. They had a harpsichord in the middle of the room, and he was jamming on it like one of those douches that brings the acoustic guitar out. Except he's jamming Wonderwall on a harpsichord. This time. <laughs> um, I do yeah. say today will be the day that I'm gonna come back to you. Oh. <laughs> Oh, wow. By now, oh, we should... Please, <laughs> okay, no, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm not going to oh, do Oh, it's so painful. Um, So, you know, this whole thing's I do going... say maybe. Oh, uh, this whole thing's going down, and <laughs> Faraday has a realization that maybe he actually likes Caroline a little bit, because he realizes that the party was thrown to, uh, you know, maybe get her betrothed, and he was like, oh, fuck, do I like this woman that's not pretty? Like, that's kind of a thought he has, and I was just yeah. like, oh, this is so heartbreaking. What a dick. Um, so then uh, the Baker the Baker Hides uh, have their young daughter with them, and, you know, she's kind of their primary amusement. You know, oh, a cute child. You know, she's a little, a little annoying, as children are, um, but she is entertaining people just by being a child. And then... She goes over um, to the family dog, Jip, um, who Caroline loves. It's Caroline's dog, and they've had them for a, very, for a long time. He's an older dog. You know, he's clearly an elderly dog, so he's got gray on his muzzle, and, you know, he's def- described as being elderly. Um, and the girl and the dog are over by the window, kind of, like, behind the harpsichord where no one can see them. And suddenly there's, like, you know... It's obvious that the dog is attacking her. The dog bites her face, and it's so bad that she immediately needs stitches. So Faraday is there and takes her down to the kitchen and stitches up her face. And this turns into the just the biggest scandal of the of the year. Um, and the bake the Baker Hides are fucking pissed, and they f- inevitably force um, the heirs to um, euthanize poor Jip, even though Jip has never been aggressive he is always a sweetheart even even when he is described even when he's like described um in the text kind of in you know in situ or whatever like as it's happening and then he's also described anecdotally as being very sweet and never having struck out against anyone um 
you know, the heirs are like, what the fuck? We shouldn't have to put this dog down. But of course, you know, high society British shit, they of course have to. And Faraday is the one who has to put him down. And um, luckily he doesn't shoot him. He just uh, gives him some, I forget what he, he gives him some over Unspecific some anesthetic yeah. that he um. euthanizes Jip with in the saddest scene in the book, the one that actually got me. Because the writing in that scene was pretty good, I would say, especially the use of uh, the word trust in yeah. the dog's eyes as oh, uh, Carolyn was handing him off to Faraday, pretty much, which was absolutely heart-wrenching for me because, uh, I put, you know, putting animals down, especially animals that don't medically have a need to be put down is sadder. And I, I had a lot of trouble reading that scene. And that, but... Like, hey, spoiler alert, in the rest of this book, a lot of people die, too. I didn't feel much yeah, like the dog. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying That's to find... That's basically the start of uh, these inklings that something might be afoot in the house. Because earlier in the story, when Faraday even first comes to visit Betty, she mentions that there's something... She feels as if there's something evil in the house or something lurking around the corners waiting for her or something like that. And um, some of that suspicion gets brought up in this case again because, you know, Jip is normally sweet and I forget exactly how Carolyn gets it in her head, but I think even at this point she is like, something weird must have happened. It's this house. There's something in this house that is... Uh, I don't know if she says... I don't know that she says there's something in the house, but she just thinks that... she No, she thinks that the the child is the one that caused the issue. Um, Someone starts burble. It's probably Betty, actually. That is no. Starts... It's uh, I. I honestly don't. I don't think that this is when. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't super matter. Um, the but do you want me to read the passage you were talking about with the dog? I don't know if I want. To actually, no. Okay. I don't never think mind. I do. All right. We'll skip that part of the part of today's program. Um. All right. Yeah. So Faraday has to put the dog down. It's uh pretty upsetting and i just remember my note my note in that section was god damn it they're killing the one character i actually cared about i know <laughs> same here i was like I, every time jit popped up in a scene i would act as if i'm you know really in a space with this family of people that i dislike very much at least the dog is there and i can hang around with the dog yeah exactly chips in the scene by the way that's not a great name for a dog either just let's mention that right here. Yeah, I uh, so they never uh, fully expanded the name, but it's spelled G Y P, and I can well, we can all guess you know. what that's what that is. We mm -hmm. can all guess. Uh, Here's a little bit of that light country racism. <laughs> yeah. So, and what? Uh, just in case I'm being a little too obtuse, what I mean is that G Y P is likely a uh, shortened form of Gypsy, which is you know not a cool thing to say. Uh, so I don't know, but maybe it's not. Maybe maybe. Maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. But I don't probably think not. so, based probably on not. how the rest of the family feels about their estate being sold off in portions and housing being built where their gardens used to be, which oh. is they're all very upset about it. Yeah, you know what? They're having their suburban lifestyle dreams taken from them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if they only uh. survived like uh, another 80 years. <laughs> yeah. And lived in the U.S. instead. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Literally, but, uh, this, like that. But here's let's actually hop on this subject for a second of how fucking dislikable this family is, because I mean, especially in our current times where you know uh, upper class people aren't the most sympathetic looking at the moment. These are people that are literally complaining most of the book about, oh no, our giant garden that we used to frolic through as children is being sold off because we need the money so that they're going to build 24 homes for 24 families here. How terrible. It'll ruin the view. Yeah, hang on. Let me let me read a like, I, I, I got a good I got a good mark here. Um it, it just makes it so hard to relate to this family. And maybe that's authorial intent there. You're not supposed to really like the heirs. I can't imagine anyone sympathizing with them, especially after, like, Miss Ayers, Mrs. Ayers, goes off a little bit about these low-class people moving in here. Yeah, let me, uh, let me, I have a, I have a good note. Uh, I just want to read from this passage, but it's being really slow, so it's going to require some editing on your part. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You shouldn't take it so personally. There are probably a hundred landowners in England in exactly your position, all doing just what you've done today. 
There are probably a thousand, he answered, but without much force. All the fellows I used to know at school, and all the chaps I used to fly with, every time I hear from one of them, they're telling the same story. Most of them have run through their settlements already. Some are having to take jobs. <laughs> their parents are living on their nerves. I opened a newspaper this morning. A bishop was sounding off about the shame of the German. Why doesn't anyone write a piece on the shame of the Englishman? The ordinary, hard-working Englishman, with no jobs, who since the war has had to watch his property and income vanishing like so much smoke. Meanwhile, grubby little businessmen like Bab are doing all right, and men without land, without family, without the eyes of the county on them, men like that bloody Baker Hyde. And he, he abruptly stops, but my note there was, all European lives matter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, how am I supposed to sympathize with these... Yeah, it's just rants like that, like, oh, why doesn't anyone, why won't someone think of the the English, please? Why won't someone think of the English? Our upper class oh. lifestyle is fading away. I might have to sell my giant mansion and live oh. in a regular house like they're building next to it where my gardens used to be. Chris, I might have to get a, a job. <laughs> oh no, heavens, how dreadful. Heavens, yeah. So My goodness. It's, it's just that for 467 pages. All the so. pearls are clutched as tightly to the body as possible. Yeah, the the pearls are actually they're actually becoming subdermal implants <laughs> at this point. Like they're just burrowing beneath the skin. They're being clutched so tightly. I guess um, Carolyn is the least bad about this, but even yeah, she yeah. displays a little bit of oh no. The estate, and we only have two serve like the the two only having a couple servants that uh, kept hitting me wrong. Yeah. I mean, they're paying them, so it's a job, I suppose. But at the same time, she, she's like, "Oh no, I have to do the cleaning myself." Yeah. Fucking welcome to the club. Yeah. So I think it's just hard for for Chris and I to really. You know, with the backgrounds we have, it's really hard to read this and, well, and not like that I'm, these you know, people. I, I somewhat land owning in a way for me, so I'm not like too far removed from oh, this. Ah, yes, Chris of the of the landed review, so it's family <laughs> of Dorchester. <laughs> My family owns a house, right? Which is a step above a uh, lot of families. They own two, right? No, well, one in America. Yeah, <laughs> he owns castles. And- yeah. In Romania. No, I'm kidding. Um. But but yeah, my point being is like I'm not necessarily too far off from this type of person. If I hired like a cleaning person to clean my house, same thing. Chris, Chris, no, no, no. This is not even close. Yeah, but I'm not like running a farm out the back and like I don't have huge acres to sell off in portions. Well, and you also don't have an upbringing like they do where they were raised as, you know, to believe that they were better than other people um and that there was a you know kind of a a strict sense of class anyway um i do want to say although we didn't like anyone in this book really the um the writing of the characters um speech and thoughts like the the dialogue and the internal the dialogue both external and internal I feel we're both um, brilliant, brilliantly meticulous for the period. I, I mean, this definitely, like Chris said, you know, this felt like we were in nineteen the nineteen forties in England among the gentry or in the upper class. Like, I mean, there were just a lot of really particular details, the way that certain people spoke, um, and it it didn't come off. It didn't come off as. Um, unrealistic it comes off as very realistic for the time uh for the place and time so again i think i think that the author did a really great job of kind of capturing the the speech and uh tone of that you know that time and place that she was writing for it's Um, most definitely her major strength i would say and she has a lot of other books and i'm sure that some of them are also set in similar times or maybe you know even different things i'm sure that is probably her major strength based on what i saw here and it's you know if you're looking for that sort of period piece feel if you're into that this might be for you but the rest of it is just so by the numbers in a way yeah and i also just can't stand like we've talked about this before like how i know when we start reading a new terrible book club book and 
I, you know, I know immediately whether or not it's another rich white people book because they'll start dwelling on particular architectural details and technical <laughs> plant names. What those it, two things combined, <laughs> those two things combined means that this is a rich white person book. And <laughs> that happened like almost immediately. I was like, fuck, no. Oh, no. Yeah, um, I was talking about the ivy and the particular way certain rooms are arranged and the, the lines of the rooms and how quaint, uh, you know. Uh. Well, and, and this is another thing. Um, sorry, I don't I don't want to. I just want to get at least through some real plot points since, you know, we're a quarter of the way through and all that's happened is a dog bit a kid in the face. Um, so that happens. They put the dog down. Uh, then uh, Roderick starts. Well, during Roderick never shows up for the party and. At first, everyone just thinks it's because he had a dreadful headache and just didn't feel well. But Faraday eventually discovers that he ha- he experienced something supernatural and bizarre in his room, and that's why he didn't come out that night. And since that incident, he has been he has become increasingly nervous and anxious, having panic attacks, on being unable to sleep, seeing things. You know, Faraday asks him for the story and. What Roderick describes is really extraordinary because at first it was just things like he would get up in the night to go to the bathroom and there would be an ottoman, like a very large, heavy ottoman that, you know, was on one side of the room would suddenly be in his path and he would fall over. And so he had hurt himself a few times through some incidents. Um, and then probably the the most extreme one was when he was getting ready for the party that night. He was shaving uh, and he couldn't he couldn't find his cufflinks. And then... When he was shaving, his shaving mirror, like, basically walked off of the, um, the table and then flew at him and broke and cut his face. And his cufflinks dropped from thin air behind him. Like, he, he watched them through the mirror before the mirror broke. Like, just be dropped from thin air above, uh, like, from the top of the room and into, into his, uh, like, shaving water or whatever and so yeah that's pretty fucking weird um it also set the tone for what i assume the rest of the haunting would be here (laughs) which is is that we're just doing a beauty and the beast thing here and all of the little or uh, particular objects in the room were just trying to come to life and help him with a big old br guest uh, (laughs) song number but yeah like like they didn't have the vocal cords to do it yet they weren't too animated enough they're still getting their legs so they're like they just trip and fall and throw themselves at Roderick, Roderick accidentally. Yeah, honestly, that would have been a much, uh, much better interpretation of this book because Roderick is super stressed because he's, you know, quote, the man of the house as the, the son, like the only living male. Uh, and he's the one who has to deal with all the finances and running the farm that they're not very good at because they're rich people. And he's extremely stressed out all the time about it. Um, and so... You know, the stress of running the house and, um, you know, and his injury that he's always ashamed of and annoyed by, uh, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe the house was like, all right, time to come to life. These people need our help. They can only afford two servants. We gotta, we gotta It's time for us to up. step up. <laughs> it's time to be our, it's time for them to be our guests. And, uh, Put you our know. servants to the test. I'm a mirror and now I'm falling on <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh be our well guest, the next be part of the guest, haunting put the service down to rest <laughs> <laughs> the next part of the haunting is they see a lot of burn marks in the room so that's oh. clearly the candlestick yeah. guy what, what was his name oh yeah lumiere yeah lumiere that's just lumiere trying to you know <laughs> hop around and help things out because then things get spontaneously set on fire lumiere, in fact sir you must not run from me i'm trying to i don't know what accent this is yeah, so it's just it's just Lumiere, you know, fucking get a little carried away with his flame. Um, and like so said, it's, they're just getting used to being animated. It's still a little awkward. Yeah, you know, they're falling a lot. Can't can't be dropping, dropping the cufflinks. They were trying to bring him the cufflinks. Paris, yeah, I know. He just tripped and fell. It's just helpful ghost behavior, man. <laughs> just some little accidents. So they're what if I set you. multiple fires in your room? You put it out. <laughs> so before the before the you know, conflagration happens in Roderick's room. Um, he notices that there are tiny black smudges, perhaps burn marks, um, on or near all of the items that he experienced moving um, or flying into him or whatever. 
So he shows Carolyn and he's like, all of these smudges are where weird shit happened to me. There has to be a connection. And I remember at that point I was like, but why would a ghost put a smudge? Like there would only be a smudge if someone, if a human was um, trying to do something magical, right? If they were like marking things. Uh, No, you know, it's like the the miasma coming through at that point of the house because Faraday also mentions how this and other things that pop up in the house later look as if they're coming from under the finish on the wood. It's like they're coming from under it and they're just because you can't rub anything out or anything like that. So to me, that would if you know, if there was a possible ghost, it would have been this is the point of contact from ghost world. And you, yeah. when you do it, you burn through the wood a little bit, wood. right? And so the and the and the the servants are like, yeah, dude, those marks weren't there before. Like they're like, yeah, we're sure, you know. And everyone's like, huh, fucking weird. And then I don't know, a few days or weeks go by, and then Roderick's room is just on fire, and he is just lying in his bed, not moving, uh, not getting, not trying to save himself. But luckily, they end up putting the fire out. Caroline uh, ends up putting the fire out, and they. You know, they save Roderick, but they all have smoke inhalation, like, you know, and Roderick is is more disturbed than ever. And Faraday is convinced that he's lost his mind because of all the stress, the injury, um, you know, the stress of both the injury coming back from a war, you know, not yourself, as as a lot of people may feel, quote unquote, not whole, even though that's not something I subscribe to. Um, and, and also, also having to manage dis- the, the estate. Um, and, al- and also the recent disfigurement of a child yes. on his property, right. even though he wasn't there for it, he probably still feels somewhat guilty about that, too. And yeah, he being did. also facially disfigured, it could, you know, be thought of as something that might trigger some uh, bad mental episodes. And in fact, there's a is this the part where they call up the doctor to, you know, describe how Roderick has been feeling and the doctor goes, well, is there anything that could have set him off recently? And they all go, nah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. no, I don't see what could possibly no. have set him off. Never mind uh, the recent disfigurement of a child on the property or the fire that got set or the objects that he saw moving or the financial stress that he's under or his injury, which he has been receiving some treatment for, which has variable effect yeah like none of these things could possibly have set him off right and so and so because of all of those things i well while i was reading it i was like okay seems pretty likely that either that i thought someone in the house was was cause was like doing this stuff um i thought maybe it was caroline actually because i thought that she wanted like control of the estate but that isn't what happened but it just seemed like very practical reasons for him to kind of lose his mind a bit um so i just thought he lost his mind and that caroline was trying to make him lose his mind you know and it worked um but then after he gets fucking committed uh like Wilf- willfully like he wants yeah. to get out of there because he thinks he is the one possibly setting the fires or causing harm to think to the house and possibly his you know re- relatives so he, he be- wants to be taken away at some yeah point. He, he doesn't want to go to sleep because he thinks when he goes to sleep the bad stuff happens yeah he thinks it's basically like a poltergeist that's that's set on him or being fueled by him or something so yeah he he agrees to be committed um, and Faraday is all about committing him. Wow, wait, wow, so so quickly. Uh, like, from one page to the next, he's like, well, I don't think I'd commit him because he's not a he's not a harm to others or to himself. And then a few pages later, he's like, oh, yeah, we definitely got to commit him. <laughs> like, okay. He's talking about um, all this ghost stuff. We, clearly, it's for his own good. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, disappointing. Uh, and then after that... Um... He ends up spending more time with Caroline. Uh, they they go to a party together, and they dance together, and it's pretty clear that he's super into her at this point. And this is where they have the. I'm sure I'm. I'm sure I'm missing some stuff in here, but I, I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, they um they go to this party together. They um afterwards. 
it seems clear that Carolyn doesn't want to go home, and so they drive together in the car to, like, a, a nearby lake to the house or something, or a road that's near the house, and um, Caroline, like, starts rubbing her feet against the side of his leg and then Faraday grabs her foot and then works his way up her leg and then he leans in to kiss her and she almost kisses him but then just at the last minute decides like she's not into this and she you know says tries to push him away but then he he's like oh I got caught up and like tried to hold her down and I was like oh fuck and then she had to kick him to get him away from her and then you know he immediately Faraday is immediately like oh fuck I oh god I'm so sorry like I don't know what came over me um and so that like awkward shit happens and that's when I was like god damn it why is there why always always we can't I was fully ready for you know as soon as that scene started up where she's as soon as she says I'm sorry I can't I was like oh no this book is gonna do this to me again just like every book for like the past three or four months (laughs) I'm doing this podcast seems to have a sexual assault scene in it, but it it ends up with just sort of a a tussle in a way. Yeah, it's just real unfortunate. Um, yeah, so it was bad. It was a bad time for everyone. Uh, Faraday. Yeah, you know, men they just can't control themselves, Chris. Mm. You know, that's the. No, you can totally. Uh, yeah, but that's just you know that's what we're being served in this mm-hmm. book. But um, you know, it's a again. I do. I will say it's a pretty realistic interaction for those two people to have had. So, mm-hmm. and it doesn't go too far and get too graphic. So, I think it's a reasonable depiction of a realistic thing that could happen. So I wasn't too bothered by it, but. It was, you know, it was like a, a big sigh when I realized what was happening. <laughs> yep. Um, like, I can't get through one book. Nope. Just how you can't get through your life without it happening to you if you're a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It I, Honestly, I feel like if you're a person, because uh, male sexual assault is drastically underreported. So let's just say humanity, horribly fucked. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Um <laughs> So this is awkward. Like, he drops her off, and there's, like, a kiss on the cheek, and then... Th- oh, there's... yeah, she kisses him, like, yeah, after after that. And then there's, like, a week or two of him just popping up and trying to, like, see if she's all right with him still or something. He's trying to, like, talk around Miss Ayers because she's always in the room, and he keeps casting glances at Carolyn trying to read her mood for the most part, and she seems fairly standoffish. Yeah, um... So two things kind of happen simultaneously. So you have, Ro- uh, sorry, not Roderick. Um, Roderick's been committed, so he's just like out of the game for the rest of the book. Um, so forget about him. He is irrelevant. From now Taken on. out the game. Taken out the game. Take, I think he um, took himself out the game. He did way. take himself out the game. Um, so it's we're now just really dealt with Faraday, some accessory doctor characters, Carolina, Mrs. Ayers, and um like I said so simultaneously at this point in the book you kind of have um Faraday realizing he's really into Carolyn and like they kind of date in like a really 1940s British way which means they go for walks and like maybe kiss each other on the cheek or something (laughs) if that they just have like chats and walks and that's that's it I don't think they even go to a restaurant together or something they even have dinner together (laughs) Yeah, I mean, they have dinner at the house together, but they, they've been doing that. But, um, yeah, so they, you know, they're just courting her a little bit. And, you know, again, this is, like, sort of scandalous because, oh, he's a lower-class doctor. What is he doing? I think it's scandalous in his own ass. head more than anything. Like, it's just town gossip to everyone else. They're, no one's yeah. really upset about it or anything. They're just like, no. ooh, Faraday and Carol and Ayers. Well, yeah, because I guess for a while people were like, oh, is he going to go for the mom or the daughter? Because he is, he's between the ages of both of them. Um, Carolyn's 26, the mother's in her 50s or 60s, and he's in his, he's 40 maybe, 40 something? It's around there. Early 40s. Um, so, yeah, sorry, it's never, it's never exactly specific, so giving it, giving well, an estimate. Well, you know, the question of wh- which one he's going to go after is uh, pretty roundly answered in <laughs> the next segment of the book oh sorry i didn't finish describing um what was happening simultaneously oh. so while while uh faraday and carolyn are sort of developing this stilted 
pseudo romance. Extremely um, awkward the yeah, whole time. Extremely awkward and like obviously yeah, obviously a bad idea. Even by nineteen forty well, stands, which I guess is like you reach for her hand and she like kinda of slides it away and then oh no, your whole spirit is crushed. Yeah. Um so simultaneously you also have Mrs. Ayers seemingly going mad the same way Roderick did. Um, but like a different flavor of madness. So instead of moving objects and fires and smudges, Mrs. Ayers starts um she uh she starts making comments about there being something in the house and how she hopes it's her her daughter Susan who died as a what 3-year-old? 8-year-old, I think. Oh, 8. Okay. Oh, I thought she was much younger than that. No. Um but anyway, a child, you know. Uh Susan died as a child and that was before they had Caroline or Roderick. So Caroline and Roderick don't know Susan. In fact, they only ever found out about her because Caroline found a book that meant that had Susan's name on it, like inscribed in it, and she had to ask her mom about it and, you know, didn't really say much. But Mrs. Ayers was clearly severely changed by losing her first child so young. Um, and she hopes that the ghost is Susan. And she starts, fi- they start finding um, S's, like the letter S scribbled into the wainscoting uh scribbled into like behind cabinets um and in dust and stuff and then <clears throat> every time they find the s's there's more of them so the first time it's like just a couple of random s's the second time it's like series of three or four all together and the final time mrs Ayers finds writing that seemingly came from nowhere it says like suki S-U-C-K-E-Y or S-U-K-E-Y. Um, and I was, I didn't understand what that was. And then <clears throat> late, like you kind of, through the text, you learn that Suki was a nickname for Susan. So, <clears throat> so it seems like there's a ghost child writing her name on things as children do. There's also like pattering noises in different parts yeah. of the house. At one point, people are, the, the Carolyn and the servants are following a noise around the house that sounds like someone maybe running across different parts of the hall or someone knocking or tapping on something. Yeah, they, they finally decide it's like a bird in the chimney, even though it's not. There's um, these like servant call bells that are wired up to different parts of the house that will go off randomly. And there's also like a, there's also like a, a, a tele- telephone system within the house. The no, it's, t- it's, it's not a telephone. It's a, uh, it's call bells. And then there's the, like a speaking tube. It's, you know, same thing to me. I know it's a different mechanism. One's yeah, just tubes it's, it's and the other one's a wire. So. Yeah, it's different, but... But, so, and the the bells will go off at, at random, and Faraday even inspects the mechanical aspect of it and finds nothing wrong, so everyone's getting a little bit more touchy and nervous about these happenings. Carolyn, I think, is becoming increasingly more convinced that there is something up. Meanwhile, yeah. Mrs. Ayers is fully convinced that it is Susan indeed. Yeah, and she's actually kind of happy about it because she's always wanted Susan back. Um, and then there eventually is this horrifying incident where uh, Mrs. Ayers went up to the old nurseries, which, you know, haven't been used in decades since the, since the children they have, were young. They have a day nursery and a night nursery, Paris. What yeah. kind? Of... Fuck me. Yeah, I read that, too, What's and I was the like, difference? I hate this. Oh, dude, I don't know. I don't understand the need for all these goddamn rooms. Um, this one's for night boobs, and this one is for day boobs. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Um, anyway, she goes up to the nurseries, and... Um, the nurseries have like bars on the window because of course you know they didn't want the children falling out of this 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 uh house because it was on the second floor i think the second floor or third floor i forget um and i forget why she goes in there uh, do you remember why i think she hears footsteps yeah they, they're hearing noises again yeah I, I i forget if that was exactly what it was but she went up there um and she uh, ends up getting locked in the room and can hear footsteps outside, like a child's footsteps. And keep in mind, the only people in the house are Betty, Mrs. Baisley, and Caroline and herself. And the only other person that could be there is Faraday 
or like one of the work dudes, but she clearly can hear like a child's pattering, like running. Um, and then she peers out the keyhole and sees a shadow running um, and gets obviously really freaked out. Um, and then, you know, she basically has a fucking panic attack as, you know, you would. She Oh, she also hears... Um, she puts, like, the speaking tube in the nursery up to her ear and hears... What is she, does she... Does it say Susan? I forget. Yeah, she, she... hears breathing of some oh, kind. Oh, or, like, hears... something is rustling against the tubes, which she interprets as breathing. Right, she hears what sounds like... What Susan sounded like when she was dying of, um... Fuck. Uh, what's a lung? A lung thing. <laughs> Pneumonia. Uh, I think, no, it? no, it wasn't. Was it diphtheria? Um, Unspecified respiratory. No, failure. they they did specify. I just I can't remember. Well, for um, right now, unspecified. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so she thinks she hears her her you know daughter's like choking gasps or whatever, and she you know freaks out. She can't get out of the room because the door is locked. She's yelling and yelling and yelling for someone to come and banging at the door, but no one ever comes. And then finally, she bangs at the windows and they shatter and cuts up all of her wrists. And she's like screaming out the window and finally gets uh, Mrs. Baisley and Caroline's attention. You know, and they come get her out of there. But, you know, obviously that was pretty concerning. Um, and at that point, you know, that's when Faraday starts suggesting, well maybe your mom's crazy too to carolyn and carolyn's like dude they can't we can't all be nuts uh but he's like i don't know uh it sure seems like it and then he finally convinces carolyn like hey i think we need to commit your mom too and she you know oh that's right because the what the one scary scene in the book happens um that i actually liked uh sorry right before the incident that proceeds and causes that conversation about committing her is um uh, Faraday is taking Mrs. Ayers out on a walk outside for some reason. And it's like... Just to see winter. how she's doing, check out yeah. her nerves. Yeah, it's the winter. So they're just taking a walk and he's asking her how she's feeling. They they stop by the fish pond and they like, you know... Yeah, whatever. They talk about some stuff. And then as they're standing there, she admits that, you know, it's, you know, her dead daughter Susan is the ghost. And he's standing there going like, oh come on you know he's trying to be like oh come now it's not that and while he's talking to her (laughs) he watches as a big scratch appears on her chest and starts bleeding immediately and i was like fuck that's actually really cool um i thought that was a really great scene to to really kind of make it obvious to you that it it's not mental illness or it's not all mental illness and that there actually is something supernatural happening you know, and even though Faraday sees that, he he just thinks that she had some some sharp thing hidden in her gloves or something. Even though it was obvious that she didn't have her hands on her chest yeah. when it happened. He's you know? al- he's always looking for the rational explanation. He is the foil to Karnaki. If we could get both of them together in the <laughs> yeah. same room, you know, that was um, that's just a guy in a well with some mutton. I don't understand what you guys are freaking out about. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, like it, yeah, this is the opposite of Karnaki, where it's like getting to the point where it's hard to, it's fucking hard to deny that there isn't something supernatural happening at least if not solely at least in conjunction with something perhaps mental <laughs> um so that happens and then you know he's like we have to have your mother committed caroline and you know caroline agrees and and he's like i i should take her now and she's like you know they kind of decide that taking her now like right that instant would be too difficult because they have to like arrange for her to be somewhere because she couldn't possibly be in the regular psychiatric ward. She has she to go to the rich person ward. Yeah, yeah. So be- due to pro- social propriety, they put the um they put it off till the next day. And Faraday gives her gives Caroline strict instructions that she is to stay awake with her mother all night and to never leave her side because he's worried about what might happen. And, of course, as all book characters do, Carolyn fucks up and falls asleep for three hours. And uh, In a different room entirely. She was originally, like, reading next to her mother and then yep. decides, ah, I'm just gonna it'd be harmless if I took a nap now. No, she wasn't planning on napping. She was planning on having a cigarette and putting her feet up. And, of course, she fell asleep because it was five in the morning um, and she'd been up all night. So 
she falls asleep for three hours, and when she wakes up, um, she finds Betty putting breakfast out, and Betty's like, oh, your mom isn't answering the door, and then um, they can't open the door because it's locked, even though Caroline knows that when she, you know, when she was sitting there staring at the room, the door was wide open, um, and I guess there's only one key to that room, and they don't have it, so... You know, they run around the estate trying to figure out if their mother left, like, got up in the middle of the night and, like, went somewhere, like, went for a walk on the estate or something. Um, They find the key outside in the snow and realize that she threw it out the window. And then once they are able to open the door, they find that Mrs. Ayers had hanged herself with a scarf or something on the door, on the doorknob. Mm -hmm. So she's fucking dead. Um... And, you know, Faraday comes and it's like, all right. So at this point in the book, I'm like, all right, the house is just going to kill everyone. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. that's where we're going with this. Um, But then I don't know. Does anything notable even happen? Caroline finds some some paranormal books in the library and tries to tell Faraday that she really thinks that something paranormal is happening. And Faraday's like, nah, it's fine. Faraday even talks to his doctor friend who actually supports this and is like, hey, man. We don't know everything, and some of these dudes like Myers have put out some work that's kind of interesting, you know, if you want to talk about energies and stuff. And despite that, he still just says, no, it's just, you know, it's nothing ghostly. Yeah, I want to point out a thing here. The thing that Seely sort of proposes is that, or that, that's that Faraday, read. That's Faraday's doctor friend, by the way, Seely. Yeah. Um, the thing that Seely proposes is that sometimes the the unconscious wills of people can manifest physically if, if someone is suppressing something or it can't get it out otherwise it might come out in uh, the form of hauntings of sorts or these unexplainable instances are really that part of the human psyche reaching out and physically affecting the world around us yeah, so a poltergeist, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and despite this, he still refuses to consider that. Um, so, uh, even like, after you know, this... <laughs> this is the part where he's like, you know what? Let's get married, Carolyn. Yeah, he's like, hey, let's do the marriage thing. And Carolyn never actually says yes, right? Am I wrong about that? No, she's he kind of nags her for a bit. And he's at one point, he's just like, oh, can we just set a date six weeks from now? And she's like, mm, and he's like, but you know, six weeks is plenty. And she's like, okay, I guess. She pretty much reluctantly agrees to it. Yeah, and it's pretty clear that she's not that into him. Like, throughout the whole book, it's pretty obvious that she's just not super into Faraday. Like, they get along. Yeah, they get along. They're friends. But, you know, she she seems very, um, yeah, very undecided. Um, She was flirty with him at that party for a bit after she'd had something to drink. And then, you know, after the little tussle in the car she's basically very standoffish around him and even though they're courting and they'll share a chaste cheek kiss or two doesn't ever really seem to be that delighted about any of it yeah and and it's not even because of like her mother's suicide because this a lot of this stuff takes place like i said kind of in the run-up to that anyhow and it's yeah it's just not seems pretty um tepid you know (laughs) extremely (laughs) lukewarm yeah, it's not good. Faraday's um, all wrapped up in it all of a sudden, though. He is very yep. all about wanting to be married as soon as possible. Um, and He's so excited about having a wife and living in Hundreds Hall. Yeah, and it, everyone's generally congratulatory about it. He's all ready to get a ring and a dress. And Carolyn the whole time is like, can we just take can we it not? easy? Can we just yeah. slow down for a second? Nope, he does not want to slow down. Wants to go fast. <laughs> gotta gotta go fast. fast to the wedding. Gotta, gotta go fast, fast to the wedding. I got my ring um, here, see? Yeah, gotta find the other seven or nine or whatever, I forget. Um, the, but, uh, Sonic wants the emeralds. The rings are just a uh, latent power source. This is uh, your well, Sonic lore moments from... <laughs> he needs, well, he needs an emerald in the ring, in the mm-hmm. engagement ring, right? Yeah. Well, sure, emerald, the chaos emerald. engagement ring. 
Emerald's good. Emeralds are good. I like them. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, her mother has just committed suicide. Her brother has been institutionalized, and she, Caroline herself, has been left with managing this estate that was already kind of a pain in the ass. And you know, she's she's got a lot to deal with. And you, you know, she has this fucking guy who's just like, hey, 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 let's get married. Hey, 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 hey. marriage, marriage, marriage. And that's got to be fucking annoying. Um, and no, then, it's just because he wants to fuck her, right? Like, that's yeah. what always hits me about these courtships when they're so quick and in in this time period. It seems really to be every time the guy's like just wants to fuck and then well, he'll have yeah. that horrifying moment after where he goes, oh, wait. That, oh, no. Now I don't want this. Yep. Uh, and that always how it is. Um, yeah. So I was actually... So the rest of the plot points didn't surprise me, but this one thing did. Right towards the end of the book, Carolyn tells him no. He brings her a ring and a dress and some some silk flowers for the wedding, and she says, nah, not doing it. Not interested. And uh, he even says that she seems very calm and collected when she says this. She's not upset. She just says, you know, I'm really sorry. I just wasn't sure for a while and now I am sure and I really want to keep you as a friend and I don't want to hurt you but it would be worse if we went through with it you know very measured very reasonable what is Faraday's reaction to this Chris he gets so upset that he starts ranting about oh, how could you how dare you give up hundreds hall how could you do this what, what are oh, you because, going to do because, where sorry, are you going to go we didn't specify that uh Carolyn's plan is to sell off the estate and everything in it, and she just wants to start over somewhere because she's not interested in the estate. Sorry, continue. But that's pretty much how he rants at her in a very shitty way, as if, first of all, just upholding that bougie lifestyle that she doesn't even want, and for some reason Faraday is shaming her about wanting to sell things off and start over, which is undoubtedly healthier for her because... Even Faraday admits that it's uh, quite a job to run this whole estate. And this is where I began realizing that Faraday, this is his ticket into the upper gentry, he feels. This is his yeah. chance to get a huge house and live in that in much the way that he wanted to ever since he was a kid. And he stole that little acorn from the plaster molding. That's the little token that he took with him because this is the life that he wanted. And he feels this is his ticket in and he feels if, as if he's entitled to it at some point and she is ruining his plans. Yep. Uh, and I mean, it's no one's fault but his. He's the one that got all worked up about this without like actually checking in on Carolyn's feelings, you know, which is a thing you should do before you get married um, or plan to. Uh, and then after he whips the ring at her and cracks the glass behind her of a window... He, he's like, I'm going to leave this stuff here because you're, you're going to change your mind. And she's like, nah, dude. I'm really not. Uh, and he's, you know, just so, so made up about this. And, you know, he, he, uh, enlists the help of a friend and is like, hey, um, can you go talk to her for me? Because they're mutual he, friends, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. He talks to them and they're like, oh, she's, you know, she's just had it rough now and you know we'll go talk to her and try to make it better or whatever um, oh she so, called it off how dreadful yeah they're like oh she's just under a lot of stress and you know with her mother dying blah blah they're like oh we'll go we'll talk to her so the the wife of the couple goes to talk to her and carolyn's still like nah dude um my mind's made up it's not happening he goes there and tries to convince her and then finally you know she's like please stop showing up here like it's not cool i told you no he goes to his doctor friend and says Caroline herself is far from well. And he tries to fucking get her committed because he doesn't like that she doesn't want to marry him. And his, you know, props to doctor friend who says, the fuck, man? You're really trying to get this lady committed because she doesn't want to marry you? <laughs> yeah, he, he even says, if I did this for every fool that walked through here wanting to get someone committed because they wouldn't wed him, that it'd be happening a lot more often, but that's it stupid. So congrats yeah. to this one doctor that isn't massively sexist, I suppose. And it's just like, dude, get over yourself. Um, Chris, at this point in the book, you wrote a lovely tune for us. Um, oh, my my song <laughs> about how Dr. Faraday sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after the rant that he 
ha- throws at Carolyn. Um, I I knew that Faraday sucked long before this because yeah. he yeah. Uh, he he just I could tell that he really just wanted his ticket into the upper gentry. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty clear. So, uh, to the tune of the uh, to the tune of Jingle Bells, if you'll indulge me. This guy sucks. This guy sucks. This guy fucking sucks. Oh my god, he sucks so bad. He really fucking sucks. What a pompous dick. Can you believe this shit? I hope he drives away all sad and straight into a pit. Oh, this guy sucks. This guy sucks. This guy fucking sucks. Oh my god, he sucks so bad. He really fucking sucks. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, Faraday is the worst. He's... (laughs) You would think that I would relate more to the character that's trying to be rational about this, as I would in most situations where things, supernatural things might be happening. But in the end, he... He's the loopiest of them all in trying to get Carolyn committed. And I think you're supposed to realize at this point um, that here's my headcanon theory. Let's see if you agree with this, Paris. Mm -hmm. Faraday's want to get into this house at any cost possible is what manifests the hauntings. There are actual supernatural things happen, and it's his sort of pressed down dislike of the rest of the family except for carolyn who doesn't really get haunted directly that manifests uh, as hey, chris did you forget how this book ended <laughs> yeah now we, 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 oh oh at the at this moment of the at book at this moment in the book okay at this moment of the um book. so i disagree disagree slightly so i i agree that there's definitely some supernatural shit happening in the book it's pretty obvious that susan well, I think it's obvious that something posing as Susan is um, haunting them. I don't think it's Susan because why would a dead child uh, terrorize her living family and murder them? Um, maybe maybe the idea is like, you know, we'll all be together. Uh, but it seems pretty malevolent. Um, like, why would she scratch her mother's chest open? That's why that I attribute doesn't... it to Faraday. Well, I think it's a. I think it's a something that is posing as Susan. Um, I don't think it's Susan. Yeah, it's Faraday's dislike of the rest of the family manifesting as the things that scare them or upset them the most, based on what he knows about them. I don't agree. So I was also struggling um, to figure out what what caused the hauntings because it's pretty clear that. Before, um, it's pretty clear that like Betty and Mrs. Baisley sensed that something was odd, but had never actually witnessed anything. They just kind of, quote unquote, got the creeps, you know. Uh, Mrs. Like Mrs. Baisley, for example, refused to stay in the house overnight, which is I think ultimately why they ended up hiring Betty, because um, Betty lives there full time, whereas Mrs. Baisley is just a day woman, you know, like day help. Um, but yeah, Mrs. Baisley and Betty never really see or hear anything until um faraday starts it's it's really everything kicks off with the um the dog biting the child at the party but i i can't for the life of me figure out what the impetus of the haunting is like there doesn't seem to be anything that's why i landed on faraday because he and steely have the conversation about dislikes manifesting or suppressed emotions manifesting physically and a lot of the Mm. time Faraday is trying to lie to himself or convince himself about something in his internal monologues whether you know oh Carolyn's not that attractive oh wait I actually like this very plain girl oh this family that I'm being friendly with for I don't know what reason because I actually dislike them he tries to shove that aside for his ulterior motive he doesn't want to admit to himself that what he really wants is a life at Hundreds Hall. He feels as if he can bring it back from the brink, and this is his chance to take over that by marrying Carolyn. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that might be the best explanation. I mean, the the other explanation is it could be manifesting from Caroline, um, because she's kind of the only one that doesn't want to be at Hundreds and doesn't, you know, doesn't much care for this kind of lifestyle. Um, could be. You know what? Honestly, that's just as viable. Yeah, it's 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 
kind of I mean I think it's also really I, I don't know I mean I don't know that that piece makes any a lot of sense well yeah why don't we actually get to the ending now because um, I think this is the thing that fumbles the whole story yeah, so so then after Far- Faraday just can't get over the fact that Caroline doesn't want to marry him, he continues obsessing over it, um, and then one day he gets in the- a call in the middle of the night, and Caroline is also dead now. Um, and the way in which she died was pretty strange. Uh, she somehow jumped from the the top floor of the house, you know, down and down through the the. Uh, stairwell um to land just in the front hall uh obviously she died on impact and betty actually saw it happen which is kind of nuts um because betty could hear because betty's room the servant uh was right at the stairs at like the the head of the i don't know first second floor i'm not really sure um second floor stairs and yeah second third floor yeah i think there were three floors uh, i think the nursery was on the third floor fuck i said second earlier whatever so betty's room is there and she could hear caroline um walking up the stairs and she heard her say you like that um and then she heard uh i forget what else she hears but she she opens her door just in time to see caroline fall from the top floor <laughs> like no one else around her no no doesn't seem like there's a reason for it um and you know obviously there's like an inquest and they have to testify about it and you know it ultimately it comes up in court that there might have been some su- supernatural shit happening and uh that's the big scandal um but yeah i mean caroline dying too I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I want to say it's typical troubled family haunted house where the house wants them to stay forever. So it wants them to die on the premises so that they're forever there. Um, But for it to have just started randomly happening, you know, kind of out of nowhere, I don't don't really get that. Because typically in in a story like this, the house would always have been off or, or there would have been something to um like if maybe susan died and then ever since susan's death they had been experiencing things it would have made more sense or if something else had happened i i think i would have been more on board with it but it just kind of starting out of nowhere i i don't well it, don't it starts up when faraday yeah starts hanging around the family so i think that lends credence towards my theory here and i just what the thing i didn't love about the ending here is that well you know during this whole oh, wait, tr- wait, wait, trial wait, scene have... oh sorry go ahead during the whole trial scene well that night where um faraday gets a call he gets a call to just do an appendix removal or transport someone that has an appendix issue that's very late in the evening and there's a scene where that whole thing gets wrapped up and he decides to take a nap in his car and then he has uh, like weird dreams in the car and then he drives home and then at the trial he clearly has a vivid vision of Carolyn at the top of the staircase. So, I mean, come on. He had some kind of fugue episode and he shoved Carolyn off the top wait, of the stairs. Wait a second. I don't remember that at Paris, all. Paris, are you kidding me? No, that's extremely clear. What are you talking about, <laughs> Chris? I probably finished this book in a fugue state, which is why I don't fucking remember. Oh, um, Paris, you missed the whole thing about the ending. Then I don't remember what, him having what, what a is, dream you, about Carolyn. No, he no, he has he he's in his car taking a nap. Yeah, he has like yeah. a weird trippy episode, and then he ends up at home. And then during the trial, he has these very vivid memories, almost to the point of retching at the trial, about wait, wait. seeing Carolyn's face at the top of the staircase, saying uh, you at him. Okay, okay. Hey, hang on a second. I I need to let this book reload, because I do not... I don't remember that oh my God. happening. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. I was in a fugue state. My dead sister was ghosting me or something. Paris, this is my whole thing about the ending not really tying things up neatly. Ah, fuck. Hang on, hang on. Um, Ah, uh, family taint. 
but I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Family taint. Wow, twice in a row. Not okay. cutting this out. <laughs> <laughs> sea of watchful fate. Ah, here we go. Uh, was there a taint? Is that what had terrorized the family day after day, month by month, and finally destroyed it? That was what Riddle believed, or Riddell believed, clearly, and once I would have agreed with him. I would have set out the evidence just as he had, until it told the story I wanted it to tell. But my confidence in that story was shaken now. It seemed to me that the calamity that had overtaken Hundreds Hall was a far stranger thing. Not a thing to be decided on, neatly, in a small plain room in a court of law. But then, what was it? I looked up into the sea of watchful faces. I caught sight of Graham and Hepton and Seely. I think Seely nodded slightly, though whether he was urging me to speak or to silence, I don't know. I saw Betty gazing at me with her light, bewildered eyes. Then, across that image, there came another. The hundreds landing, lit bright by the moon. And once again, I seemed to see Caroline, making her sure-footed way along it. I saw her doubtfully mounting the stairs, as if drawn upwards by a familiar voice. I saw her advance into the darkness, not quite certain of what was before her. Then I saw her face. Saw it as vividly as the faces all around me. I saw recognition and understanding and horror in her expression. Just for a moment, as if it were there in the silvered surface of her moonlit eye, I even seemed to catch the outline of some shadowy, dreadful thing. I don't... <sighs> Read the part. Go and find the part where he is napping in the car after yeah, his call. Yeah, let's find that because... I, rem I mean, I remember that part where he's, like, recall, like thinking about, like, what it must have been like when she died, but it didn't seem like guilt to me. Um, it just he, seemed like he, he starts was... saying that he feels like he's going to throw up. Yeah, I think I remember that, too, but let me find the car. I found it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. Okay, okay. Okay, I see it. Yeah. The moon was so bright, the trees cast shadows, and the water seemed white as milk. The whole scene was like a photograph of itself, oddly developed and slightly unreal. I gazed at it, and it seemed to absorb me. I began to feel out of time and out of place, an absolute stranger. I think I smoked another cigarette. I know that I presently grew cold and groped about on the back seat for the old red blanket I kept in the car, the blanket I had once tucked around Carolyn and wrapped myself up in it. I felt not at all weary in the ordinary sense. I think I expected to sit there, wakeful for the rest of the night. But I turned and drew up my legs and lowered my cheek to the back of the seat, and I sank into a fretful sort of slumber almost at once. And in the slumber, I seemed to leave the car and to press on to hundreds. I saw myself doing it with all the hectic, unnatural clarity with which I'd been recalling the dash to the hospital a little while before. I saw myself cross the silvered landscape and pass like smoke through the hundreds gate. I saw myself start along the hundreds drive. But there I grew panicked and confused, for the drive was changed, was queer and wrong, was impossibly lengthy and tangled with, at the end of it, nothing but darkness. Mm. I woke in daylight. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, I think that that's fairly, um, fairly possible. I also thought that he might have killed Mrs. Ayers. Um, Could because be. Because he, he kept drugging her with whatever that was. He, he knew he was giving her too much, but he continued to anyway. Um, Varanol, I believe So, it was. yeah, yeah. So I thought that um, he may have perhaps unconsciously or sort of intentionally killed Mrs. Ayers by giving her too much of that drug. Um, yeah, and so... And he's the one who, you know, was all about having Roger committed, so... This is sort yeah, of my problem, that's... I guess, with the ending as I interpreted it. It's not, I mean, you can see how the haunting and Carolyn's death were sort of wrapped up together and built up to that ending. Especially yeah. if you're going with my theory that the haunting is a manifestation of Faraday's dislike or unease or any negative emotions you might want to ascribe to how he feels about the family getting in the way of him obtaining Hundreds Hall for himself. Yep. But I just think... There's a disconnect between that supernatural stuff that happens and then him going into a fugue state and shoving Carolyn off a third floor banister to her death, which is very plainly just something that he is doing himself, at least in my interpretation of things. Yeah. All the other haunting stuff definitely was something supernatural. The burn marks in Roderick's room, especially to me, and the mirror, you know, being lifted and thrown at him that is something supernatural 
So you can tie it up in the way that I did by saying that it's, you know, Faraday's negative emotions that manifest whether he's in the hall or not, because things will happen when he's clearly definitely awake and away from the hall, definitely not being in a fugue state. And there's just something that rubs me the wrong way about all this supernatural stuff happening that might be a manifestation of Faraday's negative emotions. And then in the end, it's just him murdering Carolyn himself. There's no really tying up of any of the haunting or anything. Maybe there doesn't have to be. I don't need a, a thorough explanation of every supernatural or paranormal thing that happens in a book. That's the point of it being spooky is the unexplained nature. And But I just don't... Those two pieces don't mesh together the way I want them to. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you that um, uh, it's it seems really likely to me that Faraday was behind... It's very possible he was behind Carolyn and Mrs. Ayres' death. And, um, I'm not yeah. even sure if I would count Miss Ayers because she did hang herself. Yeah, but he was giving her drugs that you know that's not as know. clear cut as him shoving carolyn oh i agree I, I agree i agree it's not um i don't know i suppose in some ways i like that you have a choice into how to interpret the story i think it gives the reader some credit um i think there are enough clues either way really i mean most definitely um, faraday is the little stranger whether it's his manifestation that he presses out into the house or you know, describing him as the little stranger that showed up at the yeah. party as a child and now the stranger in the house because he eventually gets the key to Hundreds Hall even though he doesn't get a deed or anything he just has a key that and he'll yeah. start showing up and like cleaning the place up after all the family has been killed or you know put away Roderick is just in the is committed for the rest of the thing so he's alive still at the end but clearly can't get access to his own estate or what have you well, I think I think uh it's actually a it's a better explanation that um Faraday Faraday's little stranger uh poltergeist is, you know, not Susan. Mm -hmm. Um because it, you know, when he was a kid, he remembers Susan. And so isn't it possible that as a young child you would write the name of your friend or or a little girl you had a crush on like you know, in the in the wainscoting or on the wall. <laughs> except, well, yeah, um, except at that point, I suppose the servant saying that this definitely wasn't here before. No, 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 I'm not saying, I'm not, sorry, you're missing my point. I'm not, maybe I'm not doing a good job explaining. I'm saying it makes more sense to me that it's not the little girl's ghost writing her own name, but rather this poltergeist of, that's perhaps taking the form of like young Faraday who ah, would be writing ah, Susan's name. Yeah. So I I think that um yeah, I think that I agree that I don't it doesn't feel terribly neat um in the way it ends. Uh and we've talked about how much we didn't really care for this style of writing, even though it is done well, you know. Um it's just not for us. My I think my biggest um, critique of this book other than it just not being a subject or genre that I like good lord the, the like the technical editing was superb except for the weird fucking f, f thing um but uh, the story editing how the fuck did this go to print at 467 pages? Oh, merciful Lord. This was a slog to read it, it by could, a mile and a half and then yeah. many more miles after that it could oh, easily Lord. have it could easily have been half that length and i think it would have been more interesting because if it was half that length the writing would have been tighter and we wouldn't have had to sit through all these scenes of like afternoon tea and yeah. and going through the photographs and, and uh, oh heavens oh, the 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 pores are moving in oh no like, faraday has a appendicitis to treat you know it's just yeah, like cut out a couple of those extra haunting scenes a couple of the lightly racist or classist scenes maybe <laughs> Well, the thing is, like, I understand that they're there to provide a fuller picture, but honestly, I just felt like it was extra. It didn't need to be there. I don't think we got anything more by all of those extra conversations and interactions. There were so many that could have easily been cut. Um, and my other... So, yeah, my my main issue is that 
it should have been much shorter and I think I would have been able to get into it more because think about it. Imagine if we didn't sit through 120 pages with no haunting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, imagine if it was like if the shit started at that party. Like it would have been oh, a, a yeah, lot you could better. Go, you could go straight from him as a part, like you know, at a, at the party as a, as a little kid. Yep, maybe, to the party as an adult. Or Perfect. He, you know, you could even do the whole Betty thing just to bring, you know, tell why he's at the party. Why? Why is he like you know brought in with this family all of a sudden? Have the thing with Betty, and then immediately after that happens, oh, we're having a party next week. Why don't you come, Doctor Faraday? And we I think could it could cut eighty pages. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's other stuff that could easily have been cut. Like, I think they really should have kept the strong, um, like, the stronger hauntings and, and scenes where we really get something out of it. And um, and I know part of the length is due to this style of writing, because like I said, it's all about the architecture, the rooms, the furniture, the wallpaper, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's, so I don't know that much could have been done about that, but it's like, how many times do we have to describe these fucking rooms? I don't. I don't. It's like think every we... time he shows up at hundreds, he's <sighs> he's bitching about a new thing that looks shitty. Yeah, there's like a and... brand new thing to describe as dilapidated this time. One time it's the ivy crawling up the wall. The other time it's the saloon and the wallpaper in there. Another time it's oh, the, this fountain here has been all a crumble. Yeah, and I think um, I definitely understand showing instead of telling because we we would never encourage any authors to tell instead of show but i don't yes, think it's Faraday necessary just rolls up and says what a shithole it's a... <laughs> i don't think it's necessary to show quite this much um what an asshole was... i'm sorry <laughs> um yeah i uh anyway so yeah i really think it could have been the writing could have been tighter if they had pared down a lot of the unnecessary scenes or um, how about this? Instead of the ringing servant bells and the tube system, just one of the two. Just pick yeah. one. Yeah. The tube, honestly, the tube makes more sense because it went up to the nursery. Like, one of them yeah. went up to the nursery. So, like, cut the bell thing. Like, do we need Mrs. Baisley and Betty? I don't know. Probably not. Um, I Because there were also people that worked on the farm. I forget the dude's name, but Makins I don't know. I was one. Makins, yeah. I'm assuming they had Mrs. Baisley and Betty so that you kind of have the servants in agreement that something's going on. One's a child, one's but, an adult, so you have yeah. two different perspectives. Sure, and I think I think that's fine. Um, I think a lot of Faraday's scenes with his doctor friends could have been shorter, or some of them, you know, perhaps not even have happened. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of that stuff uh, that could have been... 467 pages was yeah, a lot. It's, it was, it's it was a, lot. a real lot. Hey, patrons, try to send us things 300 or under in the future. Hey, 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 you don't, you don't talk to our patrons. Like I know, that, I'm Chris. just... Uh, please. I'm, it's a nice request. You don't have to. If whatever you select for us to read, we will read. But just for... My, please. 300 or under. <laughs> nah, it's, Actually, it's wait. Fine. I think this patron in particular is a top donor, right? Yes. Okay, well then, yeah, she gets 500 pages. <laughs> yeah, Ver Veronica, you can, you can give us whatever you want. Give us a fucking dictionary and we'll review it for you. Um, oh God. Please don't. Please, please no. don't. Um, Terrible but, word club. She's so rating my, every uh, word. <laughs> Aardvark. <laughs> it's umbrella. all right. Ten years from now, umbrella. Um. <laughs> you're, you're already uh, decrepit in ten years. <laughs> oh, Chris, in ten years I'm going to be 41. I'm an old hag, oh. which we learned from Terry Goodkind. Oh, I will be course. an old hag at 41. Um, piggybacking on what I just said about how verbose all of the architectural descriptions and sort of like mood setting stuff was, I actually think the story would be a lot better suited to a film or a short miniseries. I would agree. A um, lot of the scenery changes sort of described, a, you know, so much real they, estate. Yeah. After so much they real happened. estate. It, oh, sorry. Sorry. Go say, ahead. Uh, they're described as if they're being recounted to Faraday after they happened which is a perfect setup for you know a flashback or like in, in a movie where the, the voiceover of the character describing the story happens as the creepy thing happens yeah and then at the end you know whoever's telling him can just be like get out now out you go yeah. um, <laughs> which is exactly what we want from a ghost story of this <laughs> time um but uh seriously though i think that there's so much uh textual real estate spent on visuals that we could really just cut the shit if it was a if it was a movie or yeah, or we just a need to establish some shots. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, you just you can see everything. So you don't need to fucking waste your words describing it. Um, And I just think that these personalities would be perhaps brought to life a bit more with actors, you know, because you can see their faces emoting and, you know, perhaps the speech would sound more natural if we were actually hearing people say these things and, and, and watching their body language with it. I feel like just reading it, it's really hard for me to mm, become invested because I'm not into this style, but I think seeing it could, could work. Um, and I just think that the whole troubled rich white family in a big old haunted house, you know, like I mentioned at the start, we have the fall of the house of Usher, uh, the haunting of Hill house. And I'm sure there are many others, uh, what the Amityville horror, uh, although that was, that was kind of a whole other thing. I don't know that I would really consider that like a, I mean, it's a work of fiction, but anyway, not going to talk about that right now, but, um, there actually is a movie mm-hmm. based on this, so Chris and I will uh, watch this for patrons, I'm sure, since we do love to try to watch things that are directly related to things we've read. So I I don't know. I'm hoping for more. I mean, it, it, it was just made in 2018, so it's relatively new. So, you know, I have hopes. I have hopes that the film could, could be work. decent. I think it yeah. could work. It could be a slightly better Crimson Peak. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I totally, I was totally wrong at the beginning of this. I was like, "All right, I'm putting my bet down for incest," and there was no incest, so I was Mercifully. pretty happy about it. Pretty happy about it, yeah. Um, I also wanted to say that I think, um, I think I well, I already talked about how I appreciated this. I appreciated the uh, attention to detail and uh, the dedication to historical realism, even if I found the style itself rigid and boring. Uh, I, I think that Faraday's shittiness and his kind of was like really was portrayed really well. Mm-hmm. I found myself hating him by the end, which is perfect. That's how you know a character is written well. So <laughs> when you hate them at the end. Yeah, I love. Well, I'm saying, well, <laughs> I'm, well, if you have an extreme emotion either way, if you love a character or hate them, I think that sure. that shows you that, you know, a character was well written. Um, and I just love that Caroline turned Faraday down for marriage. Oh, man. I was just like, mm-hmm. fuck you, Faraday. Um, but, yeah. So, ultimately, I think that this book is just not for us. It's not for me. It's not for Chris. Uh, but, as Chris mentioned earlier, if you are into, like, meticulously researched historical fiction, specifically about 1940s post-war England, uh, if you're cool with dry-ass British writing about molding on doors you like yourself um, a good heavens or how dreadful <laughs> yeah and you're really into like class stuff uh you know class struggles and and maybe a touch of ghosts i could see why i could see why people might like this you know um i don't chris i think i'm going to say i don't think it is a truly terrible book it is terrible for me but that is this i is don't a think solid 2.5 out of 5 just right down the middle of the road. Uh, I'd knock it up. I'd knock it up to a three because of the research clearly put into the writing. Sure, uh, all right. Period. Um, yeah, it's. I. I just think that maybe if this same story, uh, if if we are interpreting it correctly, I think that this same story would be. Um, I think I could like it if it wasn't if the writing style was different. Um, or like I said, if it was a movie or a miniseries, you know. Um, We're just so compressed we'll see. A little. Yeah, and also, and also, if half of it wasn't there, <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. It's tough for me to call this terrible because I definitely wouldn't call it terrible. Yeah, that's the thing. I wouldn't either. Um, it's just not like in in my personal Paris library, it would be terrible because I'd be like, I would never recommend this to anyone. You know, I wouldn't be like. If a friend was like, "Hey, you want to recommend me a book?" I wouldn't be like, "Oh, the little stranger." You know, I'd be like. I'd recommend them something else. And then if they said, oh, but I really want to be bored to fucking death over 467 <laughs> pages yeah. along with the characters. No, I'm kidding. I, but if they, if someone told me they were into, you know, British period stuff from the early to mid 20th century and they really like that kind of writing, I'd be like, oh, well, you know, you might like this book. So it's it's a book that I would only suggest to people if I knew ahead of time that they had... Uh, a stake in in some of these characteristics of the book. It's not something I would just outright recommend. Yeah, I would. F- I feel exactly the same way about it, honestly. Yeah. So anyway, um, 
I, I honestly, I think this author put a lot of work into this, so I don't want to disparage her, you know? Um, it's just, yeah, no, I think this is just... Yeah, job for the most yeah, part. Yeah, no, I just think that this is, it's just a situ, it's just one of those situations where the book isn't awful, it's just not for us, yeah. you know? And that's, I mean, that's going to happen, right? Um, honestly, it was really nice to read something that didn't have typos every sentence uh-huh. or every other page, and what didn't have a graphic sex or graphic rape scene or like you know it was it's good it's a nice change of pace even if it was really brutal to read all of it and get (laughs) through it without your eyes glazing over um all right well uh since we are done with the book uh is there anything else we wanted to talk about chris you got anything uh i think you got your few things you'd like to go over here i'm gonna hang back on this episode okay uh so we got some patron mail from kieran uh, I just wanted to thank him for a message he sent us about War Elephants. So, uh, War Elephants, this is a reference to our last Maradonia episode, R.I.P. Maradonia. Um, and in he, piss. yeah, uh, Kieran explained to us that the the convention by which um, the elephant riders or handlers would you know, uh, drive a, a chisel between their ears and, and kill them, you know, like drive a chisel with a mallet, uh, was actually real. That actually fucking happened. Holy shit. We thought, um, you know, when we read Maradonia, we were like, that's horrifying. I can't believe that this was included in the text. And I guess we should have known better, um, that this was just pulled from something in history, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a real practice. Um, according to Livy in his History of Rome, obviously this is translated, um, more of the elephants were slain by their own drivers than by the enemy. These used to have a carpenter's chisel and a mallet. When the beasts began to grow wild and to dash into their own men, the keeper would place the chisel between the ears, precisely at the joint which connects the neck with the head, and would drive it in with all possible force. That had been found to be the quickest means of death in a brute of such size when they got beyond the hope of control." Yikes. Um, hey, guys, so, if you've got to keep doing that to control your armored vehicle, maybe that's not a great use of resources. Yeah, right. Maybe don't terrorize them and starve them. What about and, the and... guy on top of the... El- like, he has to... Does he have to dismount really quick? Or does he have to hope the thing doesn't fall over onto him? What, I don't... What yeah, is I the don't pr- know. Does he yabba-dabba-doo down the tail after? Uh, I don't know, but it sounds horrific. Um, and then Kieran also told us about... Uh, Something related to elephants that Maradonia, or related to these war elephants that Maradonia tragically missed out on, uh, which is the practice of execution by elephant. Um, and Kieran says, there might be more metal ways to go out, but I can't think of many. So I, must, I really appreciated that. Execution by, if you go to the Wikipedia, execution by elephant was a common method of capital punishment in South and Southeast Asia, particularly in India, where Asian elephants were used to crush, dismember, or torture captives in public executions. I wonder if you have to get them angry or something first. Oh, wow. Or it's are really... elephants natural human stompers? Oh, man. Uh, no, I I don't know. But uh, I, I don't want to go too much into it. But yeah, too bad Maradonia didn't have execution by elephant. I agree. Would have made things <laughs> what if that's how Joey and Maya went out? <laughs> and then they got in the wrong path of an elephant. And what, what do you know? <sighs> I don't have to write these books anymore. Fuck oh, you, Dad. Gosh. <laughs> well... Kieran, thanks for the note. Uh, it's always fun to get, you know, notes from from patrons about stuff that we missed or, you know, just didn't know about. Um, my second note tonight is about, it's about a book. It's not about a book we've read. It's about a book that I've been searching for for my entire adult life. Um, so about a year ago, maybe a little longer than that, I think I spoke on air on the show about how I had been desperately looking for this fairy tale book that I had as a kid. Um, and a few listeners um, messaged us. I-, I was all over forums. I was on Reddit and, you know, other like book book forums trying to figure out what this book was called, how I could get it. And I couldn't remember anything about the title, but I vividly remembered the illustrations. And... Um, but unfortunately, you know, it's not like you can reverse image search your mind. I'm sure I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll get there sometime soon, unfortunately. But um, I was having a really hard time finding it. And trust me, if you go looking on the internet for book of fairy tales, f- good fucking luck. There are <laughs> so many of them um, because, you know, fairy tales are most often in public domain. So people can just 
publish these collections all the time in kind of any assortment and do whatever. So there's just a lot of them. Um, and <laughs> Grimm's book um, of furry fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe about a month ago, um, I got a message on Reddit. Someone had seen my post in R What's That Book looking for this book. And they messaged me and said that they were reading this book to their kid and they knew what it was and they sent me an A Books link. And the second I saw the cover, I knew it was it. And so I ordered one and it came in the other day. <laughs> Did you and feel I like a it. choir of angels when you saw the book? from the post and like again when you open the package yeah um it was so amazing to be so validated because so many people so many people when i was saying that i was looking for this book um they would say to me oh no those those stories never appeared in such a collection or i don't know those stories i i was i was totally gaslit over this book and you motherfuckers it does exist and i was right (laughs) Um, or, it's called... or Paris, Paris, Paris. What if this is like the Mandela effect, but you did it in reverse where we've tripped into the alternate dimension where you manifested it into reality? Yeah, it was because of all my negative emotions yeah, about not having it. It manifested <laughs> as a fairy tale book for children that got published 30 years ago. Um, So it's called Classic Fairy Tales. You can see now why it was difficult to find. Um, The cover is slightly different from what I remember. It is Snow White, but it's it's not Snow White's mother. It's Snow White herself waving uh, goodbye as the seven dwarves go off to work. Um, it is illustrated by Debbie Kindred, um, and it was published by Brimax Books uh, in Newmarket, England in 1989, the year of my birth. Um, the stories include Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, The Elves and the Shoemaker, The Magic Ring, Sleeping Beauty, The Happy Prince, Hansel and Gretel, the Silver Saucer and the Russet Apple, Rapunzel, The Prince and the Black Scarf, Rumpelstiltskin, Pippi and the Swan Princess, The Golden Goose, Puss in Boots, The Selfish Giant, and The Wild Swans. Um, it's got lovely illustrations, and some of these stories, like The Silver Saucer and the Russet Apple, as I've mentioned, um, no one really knows. So, uh, I don't know. It's great. There were only five copies available anywhere. I bought one. Um, my, my boyfriend actually bought another one. Uh, so now there's only three out there that I know of. So I don't know if you, if you want this, go, go for it. Um, but I'm super happy to have it and I'm definitely planning on reading them. So thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody who tried to search for me. I know I got messages from a lot of you and I really appreciate it. So, um, oh yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry. Thanks. Thank you to kind Redditor, uh, bio nerd. Uh, thank you for just messaging me out of the blue after you saw my post from a year ago. (laughs) It's amazing. That sounds like a questionable superhero. Just what a what a just what a wonderful I don't know pandemic miracle. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, uh, I guess everyone but, gets one. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's it for today. Um, and uh, in closing, we would like to, of course, thank Veronica for choosing today's book. Thank you for recommending this book to us. We actually, I think, had a spirited discussion and had some had some solid disagreements. You know, there were things to talk about. So like a book club. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like we're a real book club. Uh, Harris, thanks, I Monica. Mean, that's the joke for this podcast for me is sometimes we are the terrible book club because we're terrible at it sometimes. I oh, think. I know. I totally I totally agree. It's really too bad that uh, people who just kind of see the show out of the corner of their eye don't really get that we're fairly self-deprecating. Uh, it's a bummer, but oh well. Fuck them. Uh, thanks, Veronica, for recommending this and for being a loyal patron for so long. We super appreciate you. And, uh, yeah, look forward to the next thing you recommend. I am going to agree with Veronica that, um, yeah, didn't didn't love it. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a book for some people, but those people are not us. Thank you to the rest of our patrons as well. Thank you, Dari, Greg, Will, D, Lynn, Sinja, Jakub. Bobby Blackcat, Jensina, Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, and Jay. If you also want to help support the show, you can donate to us on Patreon for various rewards. You can subscribe and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Goodreads. You can also share the show and tell some people about it, or rate and review us on the platform of your choice, whether that is iTunes, Podbean, or whatever. If you want to contact us directly, you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com, or you can send us a message on Goodreads, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Um, yeah, I think that is all we have to say today. Chris, any any final words? 
Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Oh well, with that, um, I hope that the rest of you are not as sweaty as I am right now. <laughs> it's, it's been a brutal two hours recording this without the fan or the air conditioner on. Why can't so. we shut the fuck up, Paris? Why do we have to talk so much? Uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.